Great. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here this morning to uh, tell you a little bit about some of the recent work uh, we've been doing at Caltech, uh, studying radiation pressure effects, uh, effects that we usually think of as very feeble. Um, but at the nanoscale, these sorts of uh, uh, radiation effects can be extremely large and can be used to realize, uh, it turns out, a wide variety of different uh, um, uh, physical effects and potential applications and devices. So uh, let me begin here. Um, one way of viewing this uh, rather, I would say it's a rather old field, but it's been developing uh, very rapidly over the last five to 10 years, um, uh, in great part due to the fact that people have started to realize that uh, at the micro and nanoscale, these effects can be very large. So, um, but historically, uh, radiation pressure was first uh, uh, um, measured uh, in uh, about 1900, 1901. Um, and you have this, this area of laser and atomic physics, which uh, has a rich history, uh, predominantly from the 60s and 70s, uh, where people were thinking about using lasers uh, to trap, for instance, uh, dielectric particles. Uh, like Art Ashkin, um, and in the, in the mid-70s, people like Ted Hench, uh, Dave Weiland, were starting to think about using lasers to, uh, uh, to apply forces to atoms and, and uh, trapped atoms. And that ultimately resulted in the generation of, for instance, ultra-cold states of matter like uh, Bose-Einstein condensates. You have another thread in this area of precision measurement, which again was also um, I would say, uh, uh, carefully studied uh, for the first time in the 70s, where people were really trying to think about measuring very, very weak classical forces. And they were worried, they started to get worried about what quantum mechanics told them about the limitations of their measurements. And so you have this whole field of precision measurement, uh, people like Kip Thorne, Colton Caves, Vladimir Roginsky. Um, they, in the 70s, they started to develop these theories of quantum measurement as it pertains to um, the similar sort of structures I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and that resulted in big uh, experiments like LIGO, the Gravitational Observatory uh, in the US. Um, and so you have this other uh, uh, aspect of this work uh, involving precision measurement. And then thirdly, you have, on the more application side, you have microelectrical mechanical systems, nano electromechanical systems. So you have a technology aspect to this as well. And this is sort of where I come in. Um, people were very interested, uh, that are interested in making precision measurements. Uh, um, usually this results in trying to make a measurement of, of something's position. Uh, and so you have like the atomic force microscope based upon these little cantilevers. Uh, you have measurements uh, uh, using, again, cantilevers of single electron spins, for instance. And then more recently you have, this is showing a, a, an optical microtoroid. This is a resonator in which light whispers around the periphery of a glass uh, toroid. Um, and this is one of the first structures that people measured radiation pressure effects in. Um, and so I've shown it here uh, along with the sort of technology aspect of things. So it's the, these three aspects that I think bring a great deal of richness to the field and, and for me personally make it, uh, you know, very interesting. So again, to give some context, uh, we there's a wide uh, array of scales uh, involved with what I'll call cavity optomechanics, okay? So this is the field in which people study radiation pressure effects, um, usually utilizing an optical cavity to build up large uh, optical fields. Uh, and so in this field of cavity optomechanics, the, the idea of scale and geometry covers, you know, roughly from the, the gravitational wave observatories I alluded to, uh, where you have kilogram masses with multi-kilometer uh, interferometers, uh, and you're usually interested in resonances uh, that might occur around you know, a few hertz. Um, you have tabletop versions of this in, in these harmonically suspended gram scale mirrors. You have atomic force uh, microscope-like cantilevers in which one places a, 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 uh, on, one, on the cantilever uh, dielectric coated mirror. Um, you have uh, also what are called membrane in the mid middle structures where you have these very thin, nanoscale thin uh, uh, membranes in which you place them inside of fabric pro cavities and study the mechanics of this nanomembrane. You have the, uh, uh, the microtoroid I've shown here, and uh, 
you also have experiments that are occurring not only just in the optical domain, but also in the microwave domain. So this is a, uh, a scanning electron microscope image. You, you can hardly make it out, but there's a tiny little nano beam here, which is coupled to the ground plane of a, of a uh, microwave strip line. And, uh, and as you move down this graph, you see that you're going from kilogram masses all the way down to, in the microwave domain, picogram masses. So you're dealing with smaller and smaller masses, and so smaller and smaller scales. And you're also uh, naturally increasing the resonance frequency of interest or the frequencies of interest from things that are in the hertz all the way up to megahertz. And so when I got into this roughly three or four years ago into this field, uh, one of the things that I wondered was, could we start playing with these sorts of masses and, 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 and working with these sorts of frequencies in the optical domain? Um, and the answer is, of course, yes, we can do this, um, uh, but you need to push below the diffraction limit. So this means starting to play games with high dielectric constant materials and, and other things. Um, but this is sort of was, was my area of expertise, so I thought it was possible. Uh, so canonically, we have to move away from the sort of uh, canonical system in which you have uh, two mirrors, uh, let's say one of them or both of them being mechanically compliant, let's say sitting on a spring, so the mass is the mirror and the spring is, is, is uh, some uh, material property of the mirror. Um, and so this is the canonical system in which you send light into such a cavity and then uh, you look at the interaction between the internal light field um, and the movement of this mirror, which is going to change the resonance. Um, and we're going to have to move away from these sorts of structures to a whole new set of structures in which we can start to push below the, uh, the diffraction limit of light in order to reach these, these very small masses and then uh, ultimately access these, these larger frequencies. So our goal was to go to sub-picogram masses, and I'll show you structures that do that, and to move towards gigahertz frequencies, and I'll talk about why that might be important as well. So um, the systems I'm going to talk about don't look at all like these Fabry-Perot cavities I just showed you, but physically they're the same thing. And this is just showing you schematically what I'm going to be talking about throughout the rest of my talk. So in, in your mind, you want to have this simple system in which one has an optical waveguide uh, that you can excite optically the system and also uh, detect uh, any light that might come out of the system. Uh, that's going to have a coupling to an optical resonance. I'm going to label it A. Uh, and that coupling rate is going to be some external coupling rate, kappa E. Uh, this optical cavity or optical resonance has some intrinsic damping, kappa I. And it also couples to a phonon or a mechanical resonance, um, which I'm going to label B, which has an intrinsic damping, gamma I. And the inherent radiation pressure coupling or optomechanical coupling, um, I'm going to normalize it uh, as a rate called G naught. And G naught represents physically uh, the shift of, the, uh, of whatever optical cavity resonance it's coupled to, okay, induced by, by the vacuum fluctuations of the phonon. So it's like a half a phonon's worth of, of energy you put in the system, uh, and then how much, you know, that corresponds to some amount of mechanical displacement or average mechanical displacement uh, uh, squared, and how much does that shift the optical cavity, all right? Typically, uh, the numbers that people are able to realize uh, maybe 10 years ago, what people were able to realize sort of hertz level shifts per phonon. So a very, very feeble, weak effect. In the structures I'm going to talk about today, we've actually been able to increase that by roughly six orders of magnitude, okay, to, to megahertz per phonon or, ha or, or, or per zero point fluctuation. So tremendously, uh, even in the span of five years, we have this greatly increased uh, coupling, which has um, spawned a whole new set of uh, potential applications, as I'll talk about. So I just want you to, here's the interaction Hamiltonian. I promise not to show too many Hamiltonians. Uh, but this is, uh, this is the interaction energy H bar G naught, so it's on the order of a megahertz in our structures. You have A dagger A, so this is the intensity of the light field inside the cavity. Uh, and then this, this is uh, the, uh, the normalized uh, 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 position operator, B plus B dagger, of the mechanical system. So you can see that, that this is the radiation pressure force here, right? So if you take the derivative of this, this is what's left over, H bar G naught times A dagger A. So the radiation pressure force is proportional to the number of photons you put inside the cavity, and it scales with this G naught parameter. Um, and what I want, again, just to take away from this is that the interaction is fundamentally nonlinear, depends on the optical intensities, uh, okay, so it's, it doesn't depend on the fields linearly. Um, and the interaction is tremendously weak because this G naught parameter is very small, all right? And there's ways of parametrically enhancing that that I'll talk about. And that's really at the heart of what people have been doing recently in this field. Okay, so I'm going to give the briefest of reviews of what uh, some of the physics behind cavity optomechanical systems are, uh, just for context for the rest of my talk. 
So um, here's our canonical system, a Fabry Pro formed between two uh, planar mirrors, one of them being mechanically compliant, uh, and this represents our mechanical oscillator. So if I send in a laser beam, um, I'll build up a field intensity, and upon reflection out of this cavity, I can either look at the phase uh, or the amplitude. Considering the amplitude, this is a Lorentzian plotted as a function of the cavity length here, so this is this, move, this, this, this uh, dx parameter. And if I was to, for instance, park my laser uh, on the side of this uh, Lorentzian, then any fluctuations in x produce a fluctuation in intensity, and then if I was just to send that optical output, the reflected signal to, to a, a photodetector, um, I would see imprinted on uh, the photodetected signal, um, if I looked at it in, in the RF spectrum, I'd see that the thermal Brownian motion of this mirror uh, would be uh, re represented here in the RF spectrum at some fre mechanical frequency. Um, and the area underneath this curve would be proportional to the, the thermal energy or the temperature of my mechanical object. So I can, you know, probe the motion. That's one, one aspect of this system using light, not surprisingly. And I can you look at the intensity as I've just discussed, or you can also, if you're right on resonance, you get zero uh, first order intensity modulation, but I can actually then just do a homodyne detection and look at the phase, uh, uh, and then also, um, which will also yield a similar sort of uh, uh, detection of the motion. Now, there's one thing I wanna point out here is that um, this, is, this sort of picture here is a classical picture of what might go on, but quantum mechanically, if I have this laser, it has some uh, quantum noise on it fundamental quantum noise, right? It's a coherent state, so it has fluctuations in the photon number um, in the phase. And, the, uh, and so these fluctuations, um, if I was to crank, for instance, this noise floor here uh, is set by shot noise in an ideal detection uh, system. So if one wants to get a higher and higher signal of noise, you think, well, my signal scales is the intensity, my shot noise scales is the square root of intensity, so I'll just keep cranking up my laser's intensity so I get better and better signal of noise, right? And I can measure smaller and smaller temperatures or smaller and smaller uh, mechanical amplitudes. But because of the quantum features of, of this uh, process, I have to worry about um, quantum mechanics, and it tells me, well, I can't have infinite signal of noise for measuring the position, uh, in this sort of continuous position measurement, so there must be fu some fundamental limit on how well I can do that, and that comes from the quantum nature of light, okay, of the coherent state I'm sending in. So if I send in this coherent state, um, what happens is eventually the fluctuations in the photon number produce fluctuations in the circulating intensity inside my cavity, and this produces a fluctuating rad radiation pressure force, which eventually starts to drive the mechanical system, stochastically, and um, I'll not, not, then I'll measure a, a temperature, which is not only just the thermal bath temperature of this mechanical oscillator, but also I'll start to measure um, uh, the, uh, the, the noise that's imparted by the light field to my measurement. And so you can find a point where the, uh, the shot noise, okay, is exactly equal to the amount of noise I'm generating uh, due to my optical measurement in an ideal measurement situation where I'm not losing any light. Um, and that power, in which I reach that point is called a standard quantum limit. If I increase the power beyond that, then I start to drive my mechanical system due to the stochastic uh, nature of the, uh, of the photon field I'm sending in. And if I have a lower power than that, then, I, then I'm dominated by shot noise. So there's an optimum power point uh, which yields the most precise measurement of, of the position. Uh, and, uh, and so this, this, uh, this limit, this standard quantum limit is fundamentally due to quantum back action. All right, it's due to the back action on the mechanical oscillator due to the quantum fluctuations of my light field. So, um, but, so quantum back action is fundamental, I can't get rid of it um, for a coherent state, it's got some, you know, the properties I just described, but there are back action effects which I can control. And I'm gonna talk about two of them right now. Uh, one of them being the optical spring, the other being optical damping. And you can view this as the real and imaginary part of the back action that light field does on the mechanical resonator's frequency. So if I was to apply my, my laser um, slightly red of the optical cavity, um, then if one considers the, the fact that as this moves back and forth, I don't just read out an intensity fluctuation, but I also get small intensity fluctuations of the internal light field, and those will produce fluctuating radiation pressure forces. And those radiation pressure forces, it turns out, um, if uh, they, they act, if I'm on the red side, they act in such a way to um, diminish the effective uh, uh, mechanical spring, 
Okay, so I've got some intrinsic mechanical spring of my uh, mechanical system. And if I'm on the red side of the cavity, it turns out that the phase of the radiation pressure fluctuations that are induced by any motion tend to uh, soften the mechanical spring. And so um, I can get, and on the blue side, I get the opposite effect. I can actually stiffen the mechanical system. Um, and so that's one form of dynamical back action, all right? Th there's another one, uh, and that's, that, that's the in-phase component of the back action. But if I consider the fact that the light field can't instantaneously respond to the mechanics, that there's some time lag, some retardation of this optical response, um, then I get uh, a, a force which is proportional, not instantaneous, but rather proportional to the velocity of the mechanical motion. And that force uh, can, yield to, can yield either damping of the mechanical system or amplification of the mechanical motion. And the easiest way to view that is not in the time domain, but rather in the frequency domain, and I've shown this here. Um, so if this is my laser tone that I'm sending into the cavity, I'm on, again on the red side of the cavity, you see that um, when I have mechanical motion, I scatter my internal light field uh, just like uh, Raman scattering uh, of, of a uh, um, optically active uh, uh, um, Raman gas or, or, or molecular gas. And so this Raman scattering produces um, either anti-Stokes scattering or Stokes scattering. Okay, anti-Stokes being the frequency of my laser light plus the mechanical frequency or Stokes scattering being the scattering from the laser beam to a lower frequency. And you can see that if you consider this density of states that's superimposed here representing the optical cavity, the Lorentzian of the cavity, then I'll enhance, in, when I'm on the red side, I'll enhance this anti-Stokes scattering. So I'll preferentially, okay, in free space, I'd, I'd have equal contributions between Stokes and anti-Stokes. But because of the coloring of the electromagnetic vacuum by the cavity, um, I, uh, when I'm on the red side, I preferentially enhance the, fa uh, the, uh, the increase of the frequency of the light I sent in. So I'm absorbing energy into the optical field. And so I tend to damp the mechanical system, right? That energy has to come from somewhere, and it comes from the mechanical motion itself. And if I'm on the blue side, the opposite happens, okay? I tend to amplify the mechanical motion, and the light field actually tends to have less energy. Uh, so, I, so it's providing energy into, in, into the mechanical system. And all of this physics I've just described has a great deal to do with prior uh, uh, experiments people have been doing with mechanical objects, uh, these being tiny little ions that are trapped in electrostatic traps, for instance, um, or RF traps. And so the laser cooling of ions, uh, which people did back in the 80s and 90s, um, is a direct analog to the physics of cavity optomechanics where you're dealing with, not with atomic ions, but rather with, uh, um, with the uh, uh, you know, macroscopic or mesoscopic uh, mechanical motion of, a, of an engineered structure, for instance. And this, the transition, the, the frequency selective element in an ion is the transition of the energy of the, fr of the, uh, of the ion itself. And in, uh, in the cavity optomechanical case, the frequency uh, selective element is the op optical cavity, all right, and you're, and you're detuning. So that's, that's some context to some of the physics I'll talk about. Um, but now let me just make a comment or a series of comments that help explain why shrinking things down to nanoscale make a big difference in this field. So let's consider, again, our canonical Fabry Pro cavity. Um, I send in light, and if one wants to, ca uh, to calculate sort of the optomechanical coupling, the radiation pressure force, um, per photon, for instance, uh, it's easy to do that. We know that light inside is such a cavity, bounces off the mirror and transfers upon reflection two times h bar k, uh, k being the wave vector of the photon, uh, momentum per bounce. And the time it takes to, to transfer that momentum is roughly the round trip time, so the force applied per photon is roughly this two h bar k over the transit time. And this in, in, uh, is equal to the optical frequency of my resonant cavity divided by the length of that cavity. So if I shrink this cavity as to as short a structure as I can, I'll get a larger, larger radiation pressure effect. So this is the scattering force picture of things. I can do even better, it turns out. I don't just have to shrink the cavity. I can actually get effective lengths which are even much smaller than the wavelength of light, all right? And I can do that as follows. So let's consider um, two, two different systems. One bring a whispering gallery microtroid that I've already mentioned. It turns out that the radiation pressure coupling scales is the, mechanical fr the optical frequency divided by the radius. So again, something related to the path length of the cavity. If I take this toroid and I, and I, make and I flatten it out and I form these sort of disc-shaped structures, and I have two of them now, so I have two discs, one on top of the other, I'll still get the radiation pressure force that's pushing out on the discs associated with this omega naught over r, the radius, okay? But in addition, I'll get a force, an optical force, which tends to attract the two disks or push them away. And that force doesn't scale with the radius. It rather scales with this gap. And the way to think about that is the photons can tunnel between 
one disk to the other, uh, and that tunneling rate scales with the exponentially with the size of this gap, and that gap can be much smaller than the wavelength of light. So I get an effective radiation pressure coupling that's pulling or pushing the disks apart, which scales as omega naught over L effective, and L effective can be much smaller than wavelength of light, and that's the point. If a one goes into the near field, these radiation pressure effects can be much larger than they are if one considers, you know, free space optics and, and, diffract and, and, and th thus be limited by diffraction limit uh, length scales. So that's our goal, is to utilize these sort of near, near field optical structure, uh, uh, forces to greatly enhance the radiation pressure coupling. And so this uh, is one of the structures that we came up with uh, a few years back, and we called it an optomechanical crystal because it combined a photonic crystal with a, an acoustic crystal in the same structure. And more than that, it wasn't just two different, you know, separate structures, but rather uh, we considered the coupling of the two waves, the optical wave and the acoustic wave, um, via radiation pressure uh, uh, coupling. And so we called that an optomechanical crystal. Um, this simplest example consists of, in this case, this is meant to be a silicon nanobeam, uh, something that's about a micron wide and a few hundred nanometers thick, in which we've patterned at a pitch of about half a micron these series of air holes into the silicon nanobeam. And if one does a simple calculation of the band structure for wa optical waves that are transported down this uh, uh, waveguide, uh, you get a band structure that looks like this. So you get strong dispersion when uh, the optical wave roughly matches the periodicity of your patterning. And this strong dispersion can be used to, uh, by chirping the lattice, by chirping this series of holes, can be used to, to, to localize photons uh, in the center of this, uh, in, into the center of this sort of defect region where we've chirped the lattice. Um, so basically this section acts like a band gap here, here and here. So this is a photonic band gap where light bounces off the, uh, due to Bragg diffraction, um, off of the mirror sections, it gets localized in the center here. These are numerical simulations of what the, the three lowest order optical uh, modes of that cavity are. Um, and then one can also consider, all right, this is designed for 200 teres photons, roughly 1.5 micron uh, uh, wavelength of light. One can also consider the band structure of the acoustic waves traveling down this, this, uh, this nanobeam. And the acoustic waves, all right, because the ratio, they, they have a frequency, the, the relevant acoustic waves have the same wavelength as the optics. They're gonna, the same wavelength is gonna be uh, Bragg scattered strongly uh, as it was for optics, and that wavelength corresponds to roughly the, the pitch of the pattern you apply. The difference is, is that the speed of sound is roughly five orders of magnitude smaller in silicon than, it is, than the speed of light. And so the relevant frequencies in the acoustic domain are five orders of magnitude smaller, so they're, they're two gigahertz instead of 200 terahertz. And so you can see this strong dispersion occurs for something on the order of a few gigahertz. And I've highlighted a few bands in color. And these bands in color are the only acoustic bands of this nanobeam, uh, which have the right symmetry uh, to couple via radiation pressure to the optical waves. All right, think of this as, you know, certain molecular vibrations um, are all inactive and certain ones aren't, all right? And so, just due to symmetry rules, these are the bands that are Raman active, so to speak. They couple via radiation pressure. And you can, in the same structure, by chirping the lattice in the central region, you can get at these high symmetry points of your band structure where the group velocity goes close to zero, um, you'll get localization of acoustic waves, just like you get localization of optical waves. And I've shown a few of these here. The one I'm gonna predominantly talk about is the breathing mode, all right? This is the one that most strongly couples to these optical waves. Um, and so back in 2009, we did some experiments of these structures, and we actually showed that we could measure the, you know, these very, very small amplitudes, so femtometer, uh, um, or, or like atometer per root hertz sort of sensitivities. We could actually study the mechanical motion of these localized acoustic waves by just playing this game, by co-localizing uh, these, these optical waves uh, with these acoustic waves, all right? All in the same engineered structure. And so this is what one of our more recent structures looks like. This is a scanning electron microscope image of one of these nanobeam structures in which uh, we have a co-localized optical wave and this breathing mode um, in, which the, uh, in which we have this very large radiation pressure coupling. Now this is a zoom in of that optical cavity. Um, and then you can see that we've also patterned it with this other strange looking structure uh, at the periphery. And this, this actually is a, uh, just an acoustic uh, band gap. And so it acoustically shields uh, uh, the optical structure even further from its environment. And that's important for some of the experiments we've been doing uh, um, by, uh, in cooling these, these, optical, uh, these mechanical systems, uh, these acoustic waves, all the way down to their quantum ground state. Um, so this just shows where the state of the art is in terms of design. I've already alluded to this, that this is again this optical, localized optical mode I talked about at around 1.5 micron in wavelength. This is the breathing mode around 5.7 gigahertz. And um, in this case, we have 
there's two contributions to the radiation pressure coupling. One comes from the moving boundaries, uh, and the other comes from the fact that silicon has a stress optical coefficient. And that stress optical coefficient, uh, in this case, we've optimized for that, and it yields an overall um, optimal mechanical coupling of roughly 780 kilohertz. And experimentally, we measure something slightly larger, probably because the, elast the elasto-optic coefficients we're using for silicon are a little bit off. But we measure something on the order of a megahertz. And so this tremendously large optical shift of the cavity from one you know, vacuum fluctuation of the acoustic wave. And, and so you might think, OK, we've made these tiny little structures. Maybe we're going to sacrifice performance in terms of the optics or the mechanics. And we'll never be able to reach any of the interesting regimes that these larger scale structures might be able to reach. And that's just not the case. So this, just sho this shows you a, um, an optical transmission scan of one of these structures in which we measure an optical cube of about 1.2 million uh, in one of these tiny little uh, uh, nanoscale structures. And we can measure at, at uh, 10 Kelvin in this case, um, the mechanical cube is also on the order of a million. So these are tremendously large factors. Even, you know, this, this Q, FQ product, the frequency Q product is an important thing for mechanical systems. And this is uh, very close to a world record and certainly a record for these, these tiny small structures. Uh, and this optical cue actually corresponds to an optical finesse because it's a half wavelength cavity. So you have something with a finesse of order a million as well. All right. So these are tremendously, um, uh, or just amazing structures um, because we can engineer all the properties. All right. We can actually engineer the acoustics and we're not reliant on, you know, uh, uh, cl you know clamping the structure uh, and, and, and losing all the radi acoustic radiation. Uh, and we're not also reliant on, um, on various, uh, uh, you know, all of it comes down to the processing for the optics as well and the etching. So um, I won't talk too much about this, but the important thing, it turns out that there's, there's if you want to view how, how good these structures are, another way to view it is this G naught that I mentioned is about a megahertz. Kappa corresponds to the optical line width. This is roughly uh, about 10%. And if one was to obtain another factor of 10 improvement, um, you'd enter a regime which is completely new. You'd, en you'd enter a regime in which individual phonons would interact nonlinearly, uh, nonlinearly, and indi individual photons would, would also act uh, nonlinearly. And this is a very exciting regime that we're not quite there yet, but, but these sort of structures should be able to enable. Um, you also want to consider, you know, it turns out that you one, one, one want, may want to use these sorts of systems for storing optical uh, information, and it turns out that this is limited by the thermal decoherence time of the system. And amazingly, this can be as large as like a five microseconds in these systems, all right? The phonon is tremendously long-lived excitation, um, and one could imagine writing optical fields into this phonon that's a mechanical vibration and reading it out, all right? And those sorts of experiments have already been done, um, but not at this sort of uh, level of performance. Okay, so I talked at the outset about the fact that this, this system is tremendously weakly coupled, um, radiation pressure-wise. And so I've drawn this in a sort of uh, 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 a suggestive way, uh, like a lambda system in, in, in an atomic species. Uh, uh, and so you have, if one applies a strong, intense control beam um, that is red detuned of the optical cavity by a mechanical frequency, as shown here, then one can consider what happens to near resonant weak probes of the optical field. And it turns out that if you adiabatically remove this intense control beam, you obtain this, this, this following Hamiltonian which is linear in the fields. Um, and the coupling now is no longer this bare coupling G naught, but rather scales as the square root of the number of photons you can put in via this control beam. All right? And so you can crank up your intensity, and then you can crank up the interactions of the weak probe fields that are near resonance with the cavity. And you, you can also look, so you get a linear Hamiltonian. You, it's tunable via the number of photons of your intense control beam. And um, it, the, the, this uh, Hamiltonian represents like a beam splitter Hamiltonian or state transfer Hamiltonian, allows me to exchange phonons from the mechanical system with photons from the optical system. And this is what I'm going to talk about in the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes of my talk, applications of this, uh, of this sort of system. And I should mention that I'm going to focus on the optical properties of the system, but the more well-known properties of the system are actually the, what happens to the mechanics when I apply an intense control beam like this on the red side. As I already mentioned, when you do that, you get a damping in the mechanical system. And this is what people have been recently using to do laser cooling of these mechanical objects. And they've recently been able to, we have and others, demonstrate the cooling of the mechanical system all the way down to the quantum ground state, right? Removed all the thermal excitation. Um, and so from the, from the standpoint of the phonon, it sees this optical damping, gamma OM, 
And this gamma OM scales as four times this capital G squared over kappa, all right, in the, in the sort of what's called the weak coupling regime. And so I, my, my, my uh, optical cooling or damping scales is the number of uh, control beam photons I put in with the intensity of my control beam. Um, and one can define a cooperativity, uh, which is the ratio of this optically induced damping of the mechanical system to the intrinsic mechanical damping. And obviously when I get a cooperativity bigger than one, I start to dress the system in an interesting way. So the mechanical system no longer behaves like just a, me a mechanical object. It starts to have features that are related to the optics as well, all right, and vice versa. Uh, so that's one view, is to view it purely from the mechanical system standpoint. Okay, I get damped and I get cooled, that's great. But there's an also another view vantage point, which is what happens to these near resonant optical photons. All right, and that's what I'm gonna focus on now. Um, this is just a laundry list of things that have done, been done just in the last few years. So we've demonstrated and others have demonstrated electromagnetically induced transparency in these structures. Okay, so in atomic physics, one knows that if you apply an intense control beam uh, and you can control the interaction in a lambda system, uh, then if you send in on the other arm a weak probe beam, you can actually by controlling that intensity, you can preferentially write the photon, uh, your, your weak signal, into, the, into a, uh, s a spin, spin wave of the atomic system, and then uh, read, read it in, and you can write it back out. All right, and you can store it in between. We've done the same thing with these optomechanical systems. All right, it's pretty amazing to think, just by poking holes in silicon, we're actually able to make this sort of quantum optical memory. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we also have done ground state cooling. We've actually cooled removed all the thermal pho phonons from the structure using laser cooling um, and brought this, this mesoscopic mechanical system into, a, uh, into, a into the quantum regime where uh, it's all of its excitations are purely you know, quantum mechanical. In this case, it's a pretty boring state. It's, in the th it's a thermal state which is very close to the ground state. Um, uh, but ultimately, that's what you need to do to do anything more interesting beyond that uh, in quantum optomechanics, which is, a, which is another field that's, that's uh, very exciting. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is the fact that one can use all of these techniques to do a lot of classical optics as well. And, uh, but you can do it all, you know, you can even do, you can do all of that classical optics at the quantum regime as well. You can actually do quantum state transfer, which is nothing, nothing more than wavelength conversion for, for nonlinear optics. Um, but the nonlinearity associated with this process is tremendously huge, right? If you wanted, one wanted to compare it to, let's say, uh, the uh, care nonlinearity of a silica fiber, it's roughly 80 dB in our structure is larger than the care nonlinearity, and it's something we can engineer, all right? So I'm gonna talk about that experiment and, and maybe make a few comments at the end about where I think all of this might be going. Um, so we, in order to do this, we came up with this concept uh, a few years back of doing phonon-photon translation, or p what I call a PPT. So instead of just having the system I described before, which is an, uh, an input optical waveguide coupled to this optical structure, which is coupled to the mechanical system, um, because we can print the system, you know, this optomechanical system into the surface of a silicon microchip, what's to stop us from actually printing not just optical waveguides, but also acoustic waveguides, okay? And so one can attach an acoustic waveguide here. And so when you have a system where you have an optical input and you strongly couple this optical input so that this coupling rate kappa E is dominated over all the intrinsic damping of the system, and you have an acoustic waveguide which outcouples or encouples uh, acoustic energy at a rate which is bigger again than, than the intrinsic damping levels. And then you get this beautiful state transfer uh, between the photons and phonons that, that are possible. And this tunable interaction G, where I turn up that intense red control beam I talked about previously that allows us to do cooling, it also allows us to do the state transfer. It drives the state transfer process. And it turns out that if one looks at the optimal uh, uh, state transfer G, um, if, you are equal, if you make it equal to the, geom the square root of the geometric mean of the uh, mechanical damping factor times the optical damping factor, then you get perfect impedance matching between the optics and the acoustics. It's amazing. These are five orders of magnitude different in frequency, but it can perfectly impedance match between these quanta or, or, acoustic or different uh, uh, fields. So I in that condition, if I send in a light field, um, it, none of it gets reflected and all of it uh, gets converted to a phonon and is extracted out this other side. And vice versa, if I send in a phonon, uh, or an acoustic wave, none of it gets reflected under this optimal translation parameter, um, and all of it comes out as an, uh, an optical wave, all right? And now you don't get this totally for free. You do have to worry about noise in the process, but that's the beauty of, of these optomechanical systems. The cavity actually allows you, its filtering properties, allows you to diminish the, the, the Stokes scattering, which is basically quantum noise in the process, to a level which is much, much less than one quanta, all right? 
And the criteria there is you have to be in the side, what's called the sideband resolve regime. It's an important regime in which kappa is much, much smaller than the mechanical frequency. If you can realize that, and our structures greatly realize that, um, then one can uh, suppress all of this quantum noise and do true, faithful, you know, quantum wavelength translation uh, using these, these uh, cavity optical mechanical systems. And I'll show you an experiment in which we've done that. So um, what we did is we didn't just do, we didn't do directly the photon to phonon, but rather we implemented the following thing where we had <coughs> an optical wave come in and we had one of these PPTs. It generates an acoustic wave. A second PPT uh, receives that acoustic wave and then converts it to an out outgoing optical wave. The beauty is that I can have a controlled laser beam here and a controlled laser beam here with two different frequencies. And because they have two different frequencies, um, this photon coming in here doesn't have to have the same color as the photon coming out here. All right? These the, the frequency of these two photons are referenced to my control beam. They're a, fr they're a mechanical frequency detuned. Um, but the two control beams can have, you know, designed to be have arbitrary frequencies. So I can do this wavelength conversion if I have two back-to-back photon-phonon -phonon translators. So schematically, this is what it might look like um, in a more integrated package. I have an optical fiber that comes into a fabric pro cavity. Um, this fabric pro cavity is coupled via radiation pressure to a phonon. You have a second cavity that's resonant at a different frequency, um, and it's coupled via radiation pressure to the same phonon. And then you can basically, you don't even need the intermediary acoustic waveguide, okay? So the photons can be directly converted virtually through the photon, or through the phonon in this process. Um, and I can control these rates G1 and G2 by a second control beam, which is a red to tune of this cavity and, and, a, and, a, and one that's red to tune of this cavity. And so these two frequency, resonances of these two cavities can be very different. And that allows me to convert photons that are sent in here to photons that are outgoing here, which have different uh, colors or different wavelengths. This is how it looks in our even more integrated fashion. We don't need two cavities. This nanobeam I showed you previously actually has two optical resonances. One at, uh, they're shown here, the fundamental mode and the second order mode. This fundamental mode's at around 1,450 nanometers. The second order mode's around 1,550 nanometers. So they're rough, they're different by al almost 10% uh, in wavelength. And they're, they span roughly an 11.2 ter terahertz uh, frequency span. And we're gonna use the four gigahertz mechanical mode to convert photons that come in here to photons that, uh, sorry, to photons that come in here to photons that come out here. So we can span 11.2 terahertz. We can actually span much larger frequency bands by using this optomechanical coupling um, with a mechanical frequency that's only a few gigahertz, all right? And, um, and this just shows you that the ideal conversion occurs when we match G1 to G2, or uh, put, in, put another way, we match the cooperativity C1 of this cavity to this, uh, between this cavity and the phonon, and between the second cavity and the, and the phonon. So we match C1 to C2 under those conditions, and under the condition that C1 and C2 are both much, much bigger than one, so we're in the large cooperativity limit, and we match the cooperativities, then we can get an internal conversion efficiency which is uh, approaching unity, all right? And so I always get asked this question, but here's just an experimental setup. I won't go into the details. Here's, our, here's one laser in which we're gonna uh, take a uh, sideband photon from this laser and convert it into a sideband of this laser. These are the two control lasers. Um, they're sent, we actually put this into a vacuum and in a cryostat um, uh, because the mechanics behave better at lower temperature right now. Um, and we use a tiny little optical fiber taper to uh, evanescently couple light into these uh, structures. So the light comes into a single mode fiber gets uh, mode cu or couples down to uh, micron sized fiber taper with very high efficiency and then we place that in the near field of our nano beam and this allows us to talk to both the 1500 band mode and the 1400 band optical mode. All right, so um, this is a, now, now we turn on both lasers, control laser beams and we studied first this blue cavity at 1460 nanometers. This is gonna be our input cavity. So this is the uh, uh, a, uh, a scan that's taken um, over the cavity resonance in reflection. And you can see something weird. You don't just see a cavity Lorentzian, but you, you see this strange, very, uh, very sharp, narrow dip in the middle of this cavity. This corresponds to quantum interference, just like an electromagnetically induced transparency between two pathways of light. One pathway which goes into the cavity and comes out, the other pathway that goes into the cavity, couples to the phonon, then couples back to the cavity and comes out. Those two pathways interfere and you get a dark state, what's called a dark state. And this is represent, represented by this dip. 
And in, in the middle of this dip, you get this what's called a transparency window, and that's where we can actually convert our photons is within this transparency window. All right, we can study the same thing on the red cavity, um, and we can see the same sort of transparency window dip, um, and so we're really converting photons between this transparency window and this transparency window. Here's the data. Um, this is the conversion efficiency as a function of this ratio C2 to C1, the cooperativities of my two uh, um, uh, cavities with my two control beams. I, can, I just change, in this case, I'm just sweeping the power of one of the control beams and leaving the other fixed. And I can see that when I get to a match cooperativity, I get, a, in this case, 2% external, total external efficiency of conversion between 1,460 band photons and 1,545 uh, nanometer uh, photons. Um, this is, and this is zoom in, this shows the bandwidth um, of that conversion, and it matches that transparency window bandwidth I showed you before, and it relates to the optimal mechanical damping that I can induce. In, thi induce. in this case, it's roughly 30 to, to, to uh, 40 megahertz of bandwidth, which isn't a lot for the optical domain, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so we roughly reach an external efficiency of 2.2%, an internal efficiency of 93% using this phonon. And again, we're using a four gigahertz phonon to translate across 11.2 terahertz of frequency. Um, and uh, I, I'll just quickly go through this, but there's obviously a little bit of thermal noise here. This is a converted tone you see here. Um, and the pedestal here represents the thermal noise. And this is, this is uh, and the quantum noise that might be introduced. And so the added noise here is because when we, pro we produce these two control beams, as I mentioned, it not only does this conversion, on the red side, it also cools the mechanical system, so we remove the thermal phonons. So um, there's only three thermal quanta in the system because we've laser cooled the system um, with our control beams. And then the quantum noise that's introduced is only one, you know, less than 0.2%, right? So this noise pedestal represents something on the order of a few quanta. So we can do conversions between 1400 nanometers and 1500 nanometers using these little mechanical systems um, with near quantum limited performance already. So with the last minute or so that I have, uh, let me just make the following comment. So technologically, um, this doesn't, you know, it's interesting to, to see the physics in action. Um, but for optical applications, you've got a narrow bandwidth. It's, you know, ten, it's tens of megahertz. This is not so exciting for, let's say, doing wavelength conversion for ultra-fast communications. Um, but let's, you know, if we think a little bit more, we realize that radiation pressure effect is completely broadband. You know, inter it, it does the same thing for optical photons as it does for microwave photons in our structure. So we don't just have to convert optical signals. We can actually convert microwave signals to optical signals. And this is a structure showing you how one might want to do that. We have our similar optimum mechanical crystal, which has an optical cavity and a mechanical cavity. But now the second cavity mode is no longer optical. Um, we have this capacitor, capacitor here, this nanoscale capacitor gap. Um, which we could attach to an inductor and form an RLC circuit in the microwave domain. And this would allow us to pump in microwave photons and have them converted via the same mechanics to a 200 terahertz optical photon. And these are completely realistic parameters based upon what we've been doing so far. So we're really excited about that possibility going forward. Okay, so I've given you this very quick overview of things we've been doing and what other people have been doing. Uh, I think it's a really exciting field. And let me just conclude, I want to thank a number of people. I want to thank uh, in particular, uh, group members like Amir Safavi Naini, graduate student in my group, um, Simon Grobacher, who comes to us from uh, Vienna in the Aspelmeyer group, Jasper Chan and Jeff Hill. These have really been the key people uh, that have been driving a lot of the work that we've been doing recently. And then our collaborators, Derek Chang, who's now at ICFO on the theory side, uh, Marcus Aspelmeyer, just mentioned in Vienna. And then we have a collaboration on the microwave to optical conversion with uh, Kardex Srinivasan and, and Vladimir Aksyok at, uh, at NIST. So with that, I'll conclude. And and thank you for your uh, attention.